If you're a real estate investor in the San Diego area and you're looking to invest out of your hometown to get better cash flow, you're going to want to watch today's show. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry world welcome to the mls search and nails the show i'm james wise this is holton wise tv man if you are looking to learn how to start build or grow your out-of-state portfolio stick around right we're going to help you out just like i'm helping out my man tom tom you're an investor from san diego and uh your story is uh you're hoping to buy two to five properties over to Next six to 12 months, and your budget is going to be around 200 k a property. We could absolutely hit those numbers for you in various markets across the USA, one of which is not San Diego, right? You can't do anything with a $200,000 budget in the San Diego market. That's why you came to me. You came to Holton Wise because we are your one-stop shop, right? We are able to identify properties that fit your needs, we are your full boots on the ground team, property management, maintenance, construction, insurance, the whole shebang. But of course, it starts here with the education, because if you're going to invest out of state, if you're going to invest out of San Diego, bro, you got to know the market. You got to know the ins, the outs. You got to know what's good or bad. That's why we represent the Cleveland market, because we walk the walk here in the Cleveland market. I've sold over $200 million worth of this stuff. We run largest scattered site real estate portfolio in the market, right? We know what we're doing. And I identified a quad for you, four-unit apartment building, priced at $149,900. You couldn't even sniff something like that in San Diego. But before I jump into the deep dive, the deep analytics on that property, I want to go over some questions because this is the first time I'm working with you and uh, you had sent me a list of questions. So let's knock those out, right? Number one, do you have a full team to represent me in the purchase, updating property, leasing, and management? Yeah, as, as I just went over, we absolutely do. We do the full thing, and uh, more info on that, if you go to the FAQ on HoltonWise.com, there's a whole property management FAQ. Uh, most of our questions about our management as well as our construction and renovation processes, we give you written answers as well as video tutorials on how the whole thing works. So definitely check that out, but yeah. We're it, dude. We are your one-stop shop for everything. We take care of the whole friggin' shebang, even insurance, okay? Will I be working with you and your team from the purchase to management, or will another team take over, right? Just went over that. We take care of everything. Who are lenders you trust and can refer me to to get pre-qualified? Can I make a purchase remotely without being in person? Oh, man, you stuck two questions for me on the same line. Damn, dog. Uh, as far as lenders, uh, we will get you our list of lenders. Everybody else who's watching this show, if you're looking for our list of lenders, just shoot us an email, sales at holtonweiss.com. Go ahead, give us your number, too. Uh, we'll call you, we'll talk to you, and we'll get you that list, right? We got traditional lenders, residential lenders, commercial lenders, non-traditional lenders, lenders who will loan to people outside the U.S. We got a whole Rolodex of lenders. Likewise, lenders, if you're out there, you're watching this show, and you would like to get on our referral program, send my team an email, sales at holtonweiss.com, or click the Advertise With Us tab on holtonweiss.com. As far as your other question in the same line, Tom, can I make a purchase remotely without being in person? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with 2021, um, it's very easy to do. Probably 95% of our clientele uh, do so all digitally. Uh, we utilize software we're able to sign right on your phone or your computer. Not a problem. As far as actually uh, closing, right, like as far as the purchase agreements, all that jazz, you sign all that on your computer, uh, you will likely need to meet with a mobile notary who can meet you at your house, who can meet you uh, at a coffee shop, wherever you're at, a mobile notary will meet with you to wet sign some papers uh, and get those notarized, and then they will ship those back to the Cleveland market. And this is uh, even if you're like out of America, right? We deal with stuff all the time where investors, they end up like in friggin' Europe or friggin' Africa, somewhere, right? When we need them to sign these papers, you can go to a U.S. consulate and get a notary there. So, yes, uh, we handle this all day, every day. Not an issue. At no point will you be required to fly to Cleveland, Ohio, just to sign some paperwork. Does not happen. Can you manage an Airbnb property if I decided to do that one on, on one of the properties? How many properties does your team currently manage? No. 
Uh, we do not mess with the Airbnb business. That is not our business model. Uh, Airbnb, if you want to go down that path, I don't see why you'd want to even invest in Cleveland, right? Uh, if we look at two markets, bro, San Diego and Cleveland, where do you think motherfuckers are going on vacation more, dude? I don't think the market makes sense uh, as far as regulations go. New ones are popping up. Not a business I'm interested in, so no, uh, no interest uh, in any type of Airbnb business on your behalf. We do zero Airbnb here. Uh, last question. If I have an LLC in California, do I need to set up an LLC in your state if I decided to hold real estate in that LLC name? No, you do not. You can uh, if you want. It'd probably be cheaper. I think uh, California every year to... Uh, I think you have an $800 fee every year for a California-based LLC. In Ohio, an Ohio-based LLC, you do not. That said, if you don't want to do that, if you do want to have your California-based LLC own the property, totally fine, does not matter to us. We will need to register that in Ohio as a foreign entity. It's very cheap. Uh, if you know how to do it, you can. If uh, you have attorney, you can just have your attorney do it. I believe the fee to the state is either $25, 50 or like 150 bucks. It's super duper cheap. Not a problem. My opinion, I'm not your attorney, not your CPA. You should probably talk to those people. But I'd say you're probably better off starting an Ohio-based LLC so you don't have to pay that $800 fee. But again, talk to your CPA, talk to your attorney. Maybe California sets it up where they hit you with the fee anyway if you have an out-of-state fee. I don't know. I don't mess with that. Uh, but either way is doable. California LLC can own property in Ohio. You as a California resident can own an Ohio LLC, right? So that solves your questions, brother. So now, without further ado, actually I lied. Let's do a little further ado. Let's take a quick break, and then we'll jump right in to the property I found for you. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's get into the meat of things, right? Let's pull up the property. While you're all here, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share, okay? 4019 Newark, Cleveland, 44109. Now, it's been on the market for 18 days, all right? That's insane based upon the price point. 149900 right? And the reason being is the rent roll. The rent roll is just horrendous, dude. That's what's killing this. But that uh, does not mean I believe you'll be able to pick it up for less than this insanely low price, this 149 No, no, no. That just means it's the only reason it already hasn't been scooped up for probably 200 k right? We only have two photos, just this one and this one. That's it, right? But here's the deal. The existing rent row right here. We got three two ones, right? Three units that are two beds, one bath, and their rents are insane. 300, 600, 350, and then we got a vacant unit. Not sure what's going on with the vacant unit. It's only one bed, one bath. If these were at market rent, this building would be gone immediately. First day on the market, probably have sold for $200,000, right? As far as the neighborhood, I love this neighborhood, dude. This is... Well, it's technically called the Clark Fulton neighborhood, but I like to call it the Metro Health neighborhood, folks. The Metro Health neighborhood. And I'm going to show you why. If we're talking about investing, right? We're talking about investing. You got high risk neighborhoods, low risk neighborhoods. The higher the risk the neighborhoods are, the better the price to rent ratios are, right? I consider this Clark Fulton neighborhood to be a high D, low C grade neighborhood, okay? I think D and C grade neighborhoods, they're, they're my ideal neighborhood to invest in for cash flow if I'm looking for low cost properties. But the level of risk out there, because that level of risk remains high, right? Of tenants not paying rent, things of that nature. I like to go with section eight. I like to go section eight in all these properties, right? I think it makes the most sense when you're in a higher level of risk neighborhood. Now, this particular neighborhood, right? Because Cleveland's got C and D grade neighborhoods all over town. This is my favorite one, the Clark Fulton neighborhood. And I call it the Metro Health neighborhood because this right here, this is the Metro Health campus, okay? It's a big old hospital. And what they are doing is they're investing a billion dollars into their campus in the surrounding Clark Fulton neighborhood, right? So you're right there in Clark Fulton. So in my opinion, 
the level of risk, you can mitigate that by going with the Section 8 program. And if I'm going to go with one of these neighborhoods where you get low cost, high price rent ratios, that's what I want to do. And I'm going to try to get a little bit. I'm going to try to eat my cake and get it too by going on top and picking a neighborhood where I think we might get some appreciation on top of the high price to rent ratios because if I'm investing in degrade neighborhood, I want to do so in the one that's got a billion dollars coming into it. And then if that's not cool enough, the other reason I really dig this neighborhood more than any other neighborhood of equal uh, risk in the Cleveland market is it borders neighborhoods that have already gentrified. Tremont, Ohio City, Detroit Shoreway, Edgewater. These are your neighborhoods where you hear about like the resurgence of Cleveland and Cleveland is hot, Cleveland's hopping, da-da-da-da-da. Those are the neighborhoods they're talking about. Those are gentrified neighborhoods. Then, of course, you got downtown and then you got Lake Erie right there, right? So logistically, I just think this neighborhood makes sense. So I like this one quite a bit. So with all that said, uh, 149.9. What the seller is asking, I believe it makes sense to offer 150 to take it down because again, if the rents were where they should be, this would be gone for 200k. As far as where the rents should be, the one bed should rent for six, the other three two beds should be at 750, right? So that'd be 2850. You're looking at 34,200 a year, right? But you don't get to keep 34,200 dollars a year, people. That's not how real estate works, especially not in a D grade neighborhood, a C grade neighborhood. But we're going to mitigate those risks, set them up to where they're, you know, reasonably predictable and measurable. As such, what you should anticipate, okay? You should anticipate fixed and variable expense estimates of performance to look a little bit like this, right? 342 is supposed to come in, but we're going to spend approximately 15,000 on the expenses including saving for repairs and maintenance at turnover, saving for vacancy and non-payment, saving for capital expenditures, roofs, furnaces, hot water tanks, right? Roofs. You don't spend money on roofs every month, but every 30 years, you're probably putting a seven, dollars $8,000 roof on a building like this. Every 30 years, you're putting in $3,000 furnaces. Every 15 years, you're putting in uh, hot water tanks. Every 15 years, rather, sorry. <clears throat> every 15 years, you're putting in hot water tanks, right? So we got to save for that, right? So that's not money you're spending today necessarily, okay? But that's money that's going to come home to you in the form of a disbursement. But don't Make the mistake of thinking that's pure cash flow because eventually you're going to have to pay the due, right? The the bill's going to come due for that stuff. Eventually you'll have to spend that money, right? So a clear, reasonable expectation of performance at full market rent on this sucker would be an NOI of 19000 right? Fifteen k of your scheduled money is going to go to your cost, right? So if you pick it up at the 150 that's why I love quads, baby. All you got to do is put down 37 and a half. The bank comes in, kicks in $112,500 for this bad boy. $112,500 on a fixed low interest 30-year note tax deductible. In my opinion, the four-unit apartment building is the best investment an investor, especially a newer investor, can make. Do you know what the worst investment a newer investor can make? The five-unit apartment building, okay? Because the financing, that's where it switches. Four, you get residential financing. Five, you get commercial financing. This, four, it's the most units you can get for one loan, and residential financing is by far the best type of loan. Five, it's the least amount of units you can get on a commercial loan, and guess what? Commercial lenders do not like that stuff in their portfolio. The bigger the loan, the happier they are, right? Five units are historically a freaking nightmare uh, to finance, you know, just based upon just everything, really, right? Like the fact that most people that sell five units are typically mom and pop operators. They're not professional operators, so the numbers are all screwed up. And now that we're in commercial, we're basing our financing on DSCR, debt service coverage ratio. We're not basing it on uh, the actual borrow's abil borrower's ability to pay the note, right? Uh, so because of that, when you're dealing with unsophisticated sellers, the numbers always look screwed up, and it's really hard to pick it up with only 25% down, right? You're probably paying 50 75% down. On top of that, the level of risk for the bank is high because those are high-fail 
uh, high fail rate, right? Why? Because, again, less sophisticated people are buying those than buying huge buildings, right? Takes the same amount of work for them to underwrite and approve a loan, and the fees are much smaller. On top of all of that, right, if all of that wasn't enough, the terms are never going to be as good, right? You're never getting 30-year terms, right? You might get, like, 15, 20, or 25-year amortization, but it's usually due in five years, right? So when we have an opportunity to pick up the biggest building that qualifies for the best financing it always makes sense and if we get this thing to market rent at that price of 150 right i know it's listed at 149.9 let's come in strong man it's 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 basically a full list price offer but we're making that seller feel even better by throwing in the extra 100 bucks right it's like a dollar 99 does not feel like it's the same as two dollars even though it's the same right if we got it up to market rent we're looking at a 36 percent cash on cash return or a 13 cap now Therein lies the problem. As far as getting it up to market rent, right? We got one vacant unit. I haven't calculated any repair costs because I don't know what they would be, right? Maybe we got to repair it. Maybe we don't. We'll have to check that out after the inspection. As far as the other three units, right? I don't think you're getting Joe Schmo $300 tenant to pay $750 tomorrow, but I don't really think it makes a lot of sense to leave Joe Schmo in there indefinitely at $300. That's insane, right? This ain't charity. What I'd recommend doing, taking this thing over, the first thing I would do, is figure out how much this vacant unit costs to renovate. Then we'd get started on that. I would probably leave this $600 tenant alone. I'd probably try to re-sign them to a lease at $600. And then these two folks, three and three fifty, I'd try to get them up somewhere reasonable, right? Maybe go up to like five hundred, which is still ridiculously cheap, right? They're probably not moving because they ain't finding an apartment like this in this neighborhood for five hundred. But you're still nowhere near market. Then. After that year's up, right, you know, this unit's now stabilized. Maybe you start going 50 bucks up on him. Then you hit those two up to market rent, right? Because we don't want to just pick it up and then immediately make the building go empty. You know, we want to have money coming in the whole time, right? It doesn't, it's not in your best interest, right, to, to make it completely empty and just throw a bunch of money at it. No, let's let some money trickle in and let's handle vacancies as they occur while slowly increasing those rents. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.